Well, welcome to the final of our three Kessler conversations for the fall of 2020, focused on the topic of disease healing and pastoral care in the 16th and 21st centuries. My name is Bo Adams, and I serve as director of Pitt's Theology Library at Emory University, the home of the Richard C. Kessler Reformation Collection. I'm joined today by Professor Ronald Ritgards of Valparaiso University, where he serves as the first Eric Markle Chair in German Reformation Studies and as Professor of History, Theology, and Humanities. Professor Ritgers' distinguished career in teaching and research, first at Yale University and since 2006 at Valparaiso, has focused on the religious, intellectual, and social history of medieval and early modern Reformation Europe. He's the author of a number of important works in early Protestant theology, most notably four books, the most recent being as editor of the volume Protestants and Mysticism in Reformation Europe, published by Brill in 2019. Today, he's with us to discuss the topic of the Reformation of Suffering, which happens to be the title of his 2012 book with Oxford University Press, a book that's received wide critical acclaim. One reviewer noted, quote, no one will come away from reading it without a deeper understanding of early Lutheranism and without an admiration of the author's accomplishment. And having read it myself, I can affirm this statement and commend the book to you, not only to help you understand suffering as we'll discuss today, but also to understand the early theological questions of the Reformation. Professor Rickards is the perfect guest for us today in our Kessler Conversations, which focus on understanding the debates and figures of the 16th century, but exploring the impact their writings may have on individuals and communities in our contemporary world. I'm thrilled that he's joined us, and I know that you will enjoy learning from him. And to that end, if during our conversation together you have questions for him, I invite you to type those into the Q&A section that you'll see on the right side of your screen. And as time allows, I'll relay those questions to Professor Rickers. So Professor Rickers, thank you for joining us, particularly in the midst of what I can only imagine is a very challenging semester, and particularly on a day that I think we all recognize is filled with many anxieties. Well, it's a real pleasure being here. Uh, it's an honor to be part of this series and to be associated with the Kessler Collection, a really important collection in my field of Reformation studies. And yes, we may all need some consolation uh, today. Um, and so hopefully by the end of the hour, maybe we've found some. I think so. So I, I'll just get us started. And let's just start broadly with a focus on introduction. So if you can help us understand, perhaps better than I put it, your research and teaching interests, and, and what is your approach to studying the past 500 years old? Yeah, so uh, I'm a scholar of, I'm a historian of Christianity. I focus on the late medieval and Reformation period. And um, I take what I, what I term a kind of incarnational approach to the study of the past. And that means I'm interested in, in theology, in spirituality, in lay devotion, um, and all the embodied ways that gets worked out in real people's lives in real time. Um, and so I study everything from formal theological treatises to lay diaries and letters um, and kind of everything in between. I'm interested in the genesis of ideas and their transmission and how they get adapted and adopted and changed and how received in real people's lives in, in real time. Um, and so uh, word and flesh <laughs> are both important to me. And I think, I think uh, Christians have good theological reasons for caring about both. Um, I wonder if I could follow up a little bit more. Why do you think it's important for your students or for us as the general public to study this particular period and learn from these figures? Yeah, um, well, apropos of our, our, our contemporary context uh, with pandemic and all the things that are, that are swimming around as a result of it occurring, um, you know, I mean, different people are experiencing uh, the pandemic in different ways, but I think a lot of folks, especially in our country, it's this sort of rude intrusion into our lives. And, um, and it's, you know, we're not doing well coping with it, and we have a tough time curtailing our liberty and our consumerism in order to try to get it under control. And I think one of the reasons it makes sense to study the period that I do is I just think people were much more, this is, sounds simplistic, but people were just more realistic about what life is actually like. And that, that suffering is just, it's part and parcel of life. And you, you need to acknowledge that and you need to have a way of coping with it if you're going to live well. And so, uh, you know, I've, I've spent all of these years studying suffering. And before that, I was studying forgiveness and guilt or guilt <laughs> and, and now grief. Um, 
but the flip side of that is I get to read a lot of people who are seeking to find consolation in the midst of all of it. And I, I find it, I mean, I'm a historian, so, you know, there's a certain distance one has, but I also study the past because I'm looking for wisdom for the present. I'm trying to figure out how to live uh, faithfully as a Christian. And I think the sources that I interact with can provide at least some wisdom. I mean, they're not always a direct pipeline to the past, but there can be wisdom for us today. Well, and I think your work on suffering in the Reformation period has kind of opened up a new avenue of uh, investigation. I'm kind of curious how you came to that particular topic or that area of studying within this really interesting period. Yeah, well, uh, a couple of, there are a couple of different answers to that question. One would be uh, when I was doing my master's uh, degree, I encountered Luther's theology of the cross for the very first time. And uh, it affected a paradigm shift for me. Um, and, and I, actually, I don't want to put it, it, it was an intellectual sort of transformation for me, but it was more than that. It was an existential one as well. This notion of, of God being present in suffering, God being hidden or being God, almighty God being, being revealed <laughs> in the last place that fallen humanity would expect to find God, namely suffering and dying on the cross. That just captivated me, uh, captivated my heart, my mind, my soul. And so I had this interest and there's, profound implications for the theology of the cross for how we think about suffering. And so uh, that captivated me. Also, as a, as a historian, as I mentioned a moment ago, I'm looking for wisdom. And I'm asking kind of normative questions about how should we what should we believe? How should we live? And um, suffering is a central part of, important part of human existence. I'm a fallen, a finite human being like you are and everyone else. And so suffering is part of our existence. So I was wanting to look to the past for wisdom for this. More specifically though, um, I was doing research for my first book, The Reformation of the Keys, which examines the Lutheran practice of private confession. And I ran into two sources that were really interesting to me. One was a late medieval confession manual called the Pike Spiegel der Sünde, the mirror of confession for the sinner, early 16th century. And it was written for penitents, lay penitents, to instruct them how to go and make a good confession to their priest. In one section of this work, the author instructs the reader to go to his or her uh, priest and to say, look, I have suffered these ways. Please count this as a penance for my sin. I thought, wow, that's a really interesting way of thinking about suffering. It's a way of rendering suffering, I mean, whatever you make of that theologically, it renders suffering plausible in a way. It can be seen as a way, it can, suffering becomes salvific. Um, it plays an essential role in the salvific process of one being conformed to the image of Christ, growing in actual righteousness through the infusions of grace through the church. So that was one source. The other was a, a Lutheran church ordinance, ordinance, a kind of guide for worship and belief from 1533, uh, the Brandenburg-Nuremberg Church Order. Uh, written by Andreas Oziander and Johannes Brenz. And this was something that every pastor living in that area was required to own by law. Uh, so, you know, what are you supposed to believe? How are you supposed to celebrate baptism? How are you supposed to celebrate Lord's Supper? There's a full section on how you're supposed to think about suffering from Kreutz und Leiden concerning the cross and suffering. And I thought, wow, the, these authors think this is important enough, an attitude towards suffering. Uh, a theology of suffering, they think it's important enough to put it in the material that's required reading for their pastors. So those two sources provided the kind of immediate occasion for me wanting to investigate well, more what's going on with attitudes towards suffering in the Reformation. Well, so your book is called The Reformation of Suffering, which implies a change in the view of suffering in this period. Yeah. In fact, you, you call it arguably, the, I'm quoting, the most important change in the Christian clergy's doctrine of suffering in the pre-modern West. So what do you mean by the reformation of suffering? What does that phrase mean? Yeah, you know, one reviewer sort of got after me and said, well, <clears throat> that's the wrong title. No, nothing changed in suffering itself. Um, I said, well, yeah, I mean, it's a title. Come on, <laughs> don't take it so literally. Um, and it's a reformation and change, a reformation in attitudes towards suffering. Um, I think the first thing I want to say is reformation scholars know better than doing this. But we still frequently uh, simplify the late medieval period in order to throw in bold relief what we want to say was new in the Reformation. And so the first thing I want to say is that the late medieval church actually had many ways of trying to account for suffering, many uh, explanations, if you will. 
Um, suffering as the result of divine punishment for sin, yes, it's there. It's also there in Protestants. It doesn't go away. Um, but suffering as being an opportunity to be conformed to the image of Christ, to learn compassion, uh, to actually suffer with Christ in some sort of mystical way, or to find Christ suffering with one, uh, to be purged of sin so that one could trust um, more fully in God. I mean, those are all in play. But the one explanation that I really focused on and where I think you see this reformation, this, this profound change, is um, in a specifically late medieval understanding of suffering, and that is as a penance for sin. So that late medieval confession manual that I was referring to became very important in my research because what I discovered is this explanation, suffering if patiently born, if patiently born, faithfully born, um, and your attitude is, well, I'm receiving this in some way from, from God. If I bear it patiently, it will redound to my eternal benefit. It will conform me to Christ. It will also reduce time in purgatory. It counts as a penance that is a work of satisfaction for the remaining penalty of sin. Uh, late medieval theologians actually um, ordered suffering under the larger rubric of fasting. Fasting is one of the main works of satisfaction. Um, it reorders your relationship to yourself by, by battling concupiscence of the flesh. That's how they were understanding suffering as a species of fasting. Um, and so, and this is everywhere in the devotional and pastoral literature of the day. It's, it's ubiquitous. Well, the Reformation um, of suffering deals specifically with that understanding of suffering. And according to Luther and uh, actually every Protestant theologian, penance no longer obtains in the Christian life. There is no need for penance. Human beings have no contribution to salvation. They have a role to play, um, but they're not contributing. Um, there's no more penalty for sin uh, to atone for through cooperation with grace and one's own good works. Um, and so Luther and others remove a very, very important way of understanding suffering, of coping with suffering, because they think it's unbiblical. Uh, they think, look, there's just no biblical warrant for viewing suffering as a, as a penance for sin, uh, largely because they, th they thought that uh, suffering, uh, that, that was no such, there was no need for penance of any kind. Um, and so they create this huge pastoral problem for themselves. Um, they take away a really important way of thinking about and coping with suffering, not the only way, but an important way. And what are they going to put in its place? And so the book is about the uh, rejection of this, of this late medieval, specifically late medieval understanding of suffering and what Protestant reformers sought to put in its place. So thank you. That, that's really, really helpful to kind of frame this. And so you mentioned the big name, Martin Luther, right? And, and our collection is largely focused, not exclusively, but primarily focused on Luther. So what role does he play? Is he driving this himself? Is he just a part of this reformation? Is, is this a Luther reformation? <laughs> Yeah, this is very, Luther is central in this. Um, I have two full chapters devoted to Luther. And I trace very carefully his uh, Reformation breakthrough, which most scholars would say was a process, not a point in time, not sort of a Damascus Road experience. There were, I think, a couple of Damascus, several Damascus Road experiences <laughs> in his Reformation breakthrough. So I trace from his earliest lectures on the Psalms uh, into the early 1520s, how he is rethinking late medieval soteriology, late medieval theologies of salvation. And there were multiple theologies of salvation, all of which, by the way, required divine grace, um, but not all in the same place. Um, um, and at the same time, I see his changing attitude towards suffering. And the argument that I make is the reformation of soteriology, of theology of salvation, has as an essential part of it a reformation of a theology of suffering. Um, because again, because penance no longer makes sense. Uh, there, there, there's no sacrament of penance for Lutherans, right? There's, a, there's confession, there's absolution, and there's arguments about whether that's a sacrament or not. Uh, but penance disappears. Um, and therefore the changes in, in soteriology had profound influence for the way suffering was to be understood and experienced. And so Luther is central to this. Um, and his basic insights um, are carried on by others. Well, and, and you mentioned earlier the theology of the cross, which I think is such a central slogan, at least when I think of Luther. 
I was hoping you might could expand on that a little bit, kind of educate us on what that is and how that then connects to this new understanding of suffering that kind of moves beyond this idea of suffering as penance. Sure, yes. Yeah. Suff- uh, the theology of the cross is a way of kind of construing all of reality, actually, um, that um, sees, um, takes seriously the fact that God is, is primarily and chiefly revealed supremely revealed in the last place that fallen and finite human beings would expect to find God, namely suffering and dying on the cross uh, for us. And Luther was deeply impressed with this, with this, the central fact of the cross. God is otherwise hidden. Um, and when God reveals himself, it always confounds our fallen human reason. We would never concoct a religion that had our God dying on a cross. Um, and so this is why paradox Uh, is so important in Luther's theology. What that meant for this reformation of suffering um, is that you were to regard the suffering in your life not as indication of God's attitude towards you. You weren't supposed to rely on your fallen reason to try to figure out who God is and what God's attitude is toward you. Um, Luther thought that if you did that, that if you just tried to read your life as if it were some sort of text, you would conclude one of two things. Either God doesn't exist or God is a cosmic misanthrope. Uh, That is, God is out to get you. So when you suffer, um, Luther could retain and Lutheran theologians could retain a lot of the uh, uh, traditional explanations for suffering. It conforms you to Christ. It teaches you compassion. But the one they really emphasize is that it strips you of self-confidence and it tests faith because you need faith to see the hidden God hidden behind this veil of suffering. Um, and what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to look to the word in, in the midst of suffering and what the word tells you about who God is and what God's attitude is towards us, uh, rather than looking to oneself. And you look to the word in faith to receive what the word said. And what the word says is that God is at God's very core, um, self-giving love. Um, and so is good. <laughs> Whereas your experience in the midst of suffering is telling you the opposite. Um, and so in a sense, your reason, your own moral straining, all has to has to be has to be hoisted up on the cross in suffering, um, so that you are that you are depleted of all your natural resources for trying to concoct your own theology, so that you receive uh, the truth about God for your life uh, through faith. So this might be a tricky question, but I'm just kind of curious. It's a kind of chicken and egg question. I mean, you described that Luther kind of has a some new theological insight that then no longer his old view of suffering doesn't fit. Or is it that suffering drives the theological insight, right? Can we parse those out? Is there one that comes before the other? I think, I mean, yeah, I mean, they're, they're happening concurrently, but I think it's the I, I think it's the, theolo- the reformation of salvation, of a theology of salvation that's driving this thing. Luther, it's um, part of a, a kind of research project that I spun off from this. Um, Luther actually never, even in his earliest lectures, goes for this uh, suffering as a means of penance. It's just not there. Even when, even when most scholars would say he's a long ways away from any sort of Reformation breakthrough, it's just never there. So somehow he's predisposed, I think, uh, to come into the conclusions that he does. Um, but I would say that it's the, I mean, if you wanted to count sort of his unfechtungen, right, as a kind of spiritual suffering, right? Um, yes, I mean, he's trying to find a way to deal with the sense of being alienated from God, of being forsaken by God. Um, and so his own spiritual experience of spiritual suffering is certainly central to what's going on here. Um, and is his, I'm not the first one to say this, but his theology is so deeply pastoral. It's so deeply oriented toward the needs of conscience, the needs of heart, um, where one experiences um, alienation from God or conversely uh, reposing, trusting uh, in God. Yeah. That, that's really helpful. And, and I'm, I'm hoping you could connect Luther's idea of suffering and this kind of reformation to the broader reformation. I mean, part of your book starts with Luther, but you're really focused on the kind of Wittenberg, you know, reformers around Luther. So does does Luther's core idea or insight get expanded? Does it get changed as time moves on? I think the idea of that you can no longer count suffering as a penance for sin. Instead, suffering should be seen first and foremost, as a test of faith. 
that's something you see right down through the sources. Um, and I've traced this out through a number of other theologians with, with Luther and Wittenberg, um, through church ordinances, through devotional literature, and on into, uh, on into lay reception and diaries and letters. That idea is pretty stable um, over the course of the 16th into the early 17th century. Uh, I don't see huge shifts um, in that idea. It was an idea, I should say, that uh, some people found very difficult to swallow um, because um, it's not only that Luther and others were saying no longer see suffering as a penance for sin, they're also saying don't resort to the saints, don't resort to their relics, don't resort to, and the list goes on and on, of all these things in late medieval Christianity that Protestant theologians like Luther just found unbiblical. And I, oh, people had leaned on these things. Uh, people have found great meaning in them. And so there's all kinds of evidence that, you know, the common man or the common person uh, found it difficult to, to swallow this reformation of suffering whole uh, right away. It was a gradual process. But in terms of your question was about the theology of this thing, uh, that remains stable. Yeah. Well, one thing I really like, and you described this nicely in the, in the kind of interest that your work uh, betrays, is connecting the theological to the practical, both in the 16th century, but also today. And I think you know, many of us certainly owing to the pandemic have a new view on suffering, right? I mean, maybe the pandemic has affected us in some ways, but it's also highlighted just how much suffering there is in the current world. How do you take, or how did Luther take this high level theological idea and how did it transition into people's actual lives? And then how might we likewise learn from these 16th century theological conversations and, and have direct influence in our own behavior? Yeah, I mean, Luther and others, other Lutheran theologians, I mean, not all, but were real masters at taking sophisticated theological ideas, uh, which they were debating in Latin with one another, and translating them literally uh, into language and images and tunes and, and, and rhymes um, um, that uh, the average person at least had a chance of understanding. Um, I was just thinking of a, of a really wonderful image that I mentioned Johannes Brenz earlier, a Lutheran theologian uh, in Schwäbisch Hall uh, for a long time and then moved elsewhere. He said, look, you know, when you're suffering, you have to, um, and you're bearing the cross, right? That's, that's the language for suffering, when you're bearing the cross of whatever kind. I mean, I, I wasn't so much interested in, in pandemics and plagues and that sort of thing in my book. I was more interested in in quotidian suffering, daily suffering, both of the body and the soul. Uh, but he says, you know, when you're really suffering um, and you're bearing the cross, you have to make sure you, you, you take it up on your back only where the Christ body has already sanded down the rough wood there. I mean, what, a, what an image. Christ has already kind of borne all of the splinters of the cross for us. And so, yes, we have a cross but it's easier to bear because, because he's already with his own body uh, uh, kind of sanded away the roughness of the cross. It still hurts to bear, uh, but it's easier because Christ has borne it for us and, now, and then always bears it with us, in us, and through us. So, I mean, that's, that's a really wonderful image. Um, and so Luther and others were masters at conveying this uh, in all kinds of media uh, to the common person. Yeah, I mean, we, we talked earlier about the cover of your book, and I wondered if you want to talk a little bit about that in, in terms sure. of images. And I have some images from your book that I'll pull up here. So this, yeah. by the way, is Professor Rigger's book, which we'll talk about in a second, which I highly recommend. But if you could tell us a little bit about the, the image choice you made for the cover uh, and how that might reflect some of the argument. Right. So the image that's on the screen right now is by the same author or the same same artist, Lucas Cronach, the elder, um, as the image on the cover of the book. Right. So this is from the early 16th century. And this is something that Cronach created before he became a Lutheran. And what, what you'll notice, uh, this image of the crucifixion, uh, you'll notice the bodily contortions of the figures next to Christ, especially the one to Christ's right, who's bent over backward. Uh, of the cross. I mean, it's a grotesque image. And this is very typical of late medieval fixation on the passion. Um, but I think also art historians, I'm not one, but I've, uh, art historians have commented on this, um, that this image is saying something very important about the role of the body and its suffering in salvation. Because the, of course, the, the thief to Christ's right is, is a Dismas, St. Dismas, uh, the, 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 the priest who, uh, sorry, the, the uh, penitent who actually makes it to heaven, right? Today you will be with me in paradise. 
Um, and what this image suggests is that these bodily contortions, as grotesque as they might be, um, are, are giving the body and its suffering a role in the salvific process. And if you go to the next image, um, to the image from the late 1530s, wow, look at, the, look at the two thieves, especially the thief to Christ's right, to the penitent thief. He's almost stoic. I mean, he's suffering. I mean, he's nailed to a cross. But his body is not contorted in this way. Instead, his gaze is looking to Christ, the incarnate word. And this is an image of faith, looking to the word. This is what you do in suffering. You look to the word in faith. Uh, the body is still important for Luther, of course. Its suffering is still something that he attends to very closely. But it's lost its place in the economy of salvation that it had in the later Middle Ages. So I think these two images really illustrate nicely this transition and attitudes towards suffering. Um, and also they illustrate nicely the ability of reformers and, and, and their uh, supporters to depict literally in this case, this reformation of suffering. Yeah, we've, we've talked a lot about how important figures like Lucas Cranach, these, these artists who were you know friends of Luther, but also really theologians alongside Luther who are kind of thinking through some of these things in a visual yeah. medium and, and those images depict it very nicely. So I, I was struck by the conclusion to your book, which in many ways makes a kind of negative argument about the reformers. On the one hand, you're looking at the reformers as perhaps models or as teachers who can tell us something about how to deal with suffering in our own lives. But you conclude with the book by suggesting that there's something missing in the Reformation. And, and, and that really is the conversation about lament or kind of complaining about suffering, to put it in, in basic terms. Can you tell us a little bit about the role of lament in dealing with human suffering? Yeah, the first thing I would say is that uh, there are other scholars who see things differently uh, from, what I, from what I'm about to say. Uh, but for my part, I think there is a diminishment of lament. Um, not just in the Reformation, but even in the medieval tradition leading up to it. Um, as I was doing research for this book, uh, The Reformation of Suffering, I took a long run up to the Reformation. I started reading consolation literature even before the Christian period. Um, and then I read as much consolation uh, literature as I could from the ancient church, early medieval, medieval, up into the Reformation. At the same time, I was reading uh, Job and Psalms. And very interesting experience. Um, of course, I mean, the, the Psalms, the Job, they're all there. I mean, the, the, the Christian, Christians know these, these, these books from the ancient period forward. I simply could not find in all of the consolation literature that I was reading the kind of full-throated protest that at least you find in some of the Psalms. I mean, many lament Psalms begin with... Uh, the soul crying out to God or wondering where God is, but they, they, they end resolved in some way, trusting in God or confident that God will come through finally. But there are a few, I mean, Psalm 88 is a special, it ends darkness is my only companion, where, where the psalmist just seems to sit with that sense of absence for a while, and that's where it ends. Uh, now, whether you should read Psalm 88 in isolation from what's around it, that's a whole other conversation. Um, but there's some chutzpah <laughs> in the lament tradition in scripture that at least for my part, I found very difficult to find in the, all of the Christian consolation literature I was looking at. I remember one passage from Henry Suzo, a 14th century mystic, who was part of a movement called the Friends of God. And uh, in one of his works, he was talking about suffering and he says, I mean, he, he approaches a kind of lament. He says, well, God, if, if you were to treat your friends better, maybe you would have more of them. <laughs> Right. I mean, it's like, you know, suffering really hurts, but then he backs away from it and it's almost kind of playful. Um, Luther was deeply honest about the experience of desolation, of, of you know, the, the, the burden conscience and how and just what hell feels like in this life. I, I don't want to I don't want to take that away from Luther at all. He was a master at this description. And he got that in part, I think, from reading mystics. But in terms of the full-throated protest, where you say, God, this isn't, you're not being who you're supposed to be right now. And at least this time we didn't sin. <laughs> What's going on? Why is this happening? Where are you? Come on, wake up. That I had a tough time following, uh, finding, sorry, in the sources I was reading. Maybe there are other sources I need to turn to that where I would find it. 
And I began reflecting on this. I began, you know, if, if, I'm on, if I was, I thought if I was onto something here, if uh, there really is a loss of lament over the centuries, I started wondering and even worrying about what the long-term cultural legacy of that might have might be or might have been for Christianity. And I've wondered if a diminishment, maybe I shouldn't say a loss. I'm actually working on a project right now that is a kind of lament from a Lutheran in the early 17th century. But if the full-throated protest just isn't there in the spiritual toolbox of Christians for centuries, what's the impact of that? Mm -hmm. What's the impact on the plausibility of Christianity for the West, especially the Enlightenment forward? And I began to worry about that. And lament has become extremely important in my own spiritual life, and I think it's essential today. Well, and, and this may be an unfair question to ask you since you are a historian, but do you feel like having looked at church history that we've recovered some of that? Or is the contemporary conversation fundamentally different than you find in the 16th century? There's a lot of interest in lament today. Uh, a lot of things being published about lament. Um, in a long, long list, I, I've, I've, I've recommended one that we'll get to uh, at the end of the, our conversation. Um, and so I think that's, a, I, I'm glad for this recovery. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's something that we need as we face uh, suffering. We need it. I mean, if lament is the center of one's whole spiritual life, maybe there's some problems there. Yeah. But if it's not there in your spiritual toolbox, I think you're also in real, in real trouble. Well, and, and while we're on this topic, I see a question has come in on the side. You mentioned that the lament tradition of the Psalms and Job, obviously the reformers knew these biblical traditions. Yeah. Yeah. And Luther, of course, is interacting with the Psalms from the very beginning. Yeah. How does he handle lament? Does he not mention it? Does he just, you know, take it in a different direction? Yeah, um, I think uh, the first thing I would say is I recommend a book uh, by uh, Dennis. I think his last name is pronounced Wynn. It's N-G-I-E-N -E uh, that deals with Luther's treatment of the lament Psalms. Um, Luther, of course, knew this tradition very well. Um, he tends to interpret these uh, instances of lament as kind of the experience of the burdened conscience, is fearful that God is angry. I mean, it's, he kind of reads his own experience of Unfechtungen into the lament uh, psalms. This is, this is the situation in which one finds oneself. This is the suffering in which one finds oneself. God seems to be this angry God who's out to get me because, because I know I'm a sinner. Um, and this sets you up then for despairing of, of anything you can do to save yourself and prepares the way for faith. Um, I, I mean, that seems a, 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 at least one plausible way of interpreting some of these Psalms. But the kind of full-throated protest, why God? Why this? Why this now? Why aren't you being faithful to us? That, Luther thinks that has to be moderated. Um, Luther thinks that you have to, yeah, you can kind of kind of come up to that precipice, but then at least on my reading, he backs away from it. Um, again, I, I'm not counseling this ought to be the central piece of, <laughs> of the Christian spiritual life. But man, do we have occasion today to ask why and to wonder what's going on? I think it's a, gr a great question. And, and I just saw another note came in, so I'll ask that now. What would you say is the difference between lament and protest? One strategy of dealing with suffering has been to point to a didactic purpose, but in acute suffering, such as consoling a friend who has lost a child, there's very little to say. So what about the role of silence in suffering? Does that come up in these sources? Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, I've, I've, I've written about suffering. We're talking about my research on suffering right now. What I should have said at the very beginning is that I, I think the most important thing to learn, uh, at least from the sources that I've read, is that we should we should emulate Job's friends before they open their mouths, <laughs> uh, sitting with the suffering one for seven whole days in silence. The ministry of presence to someone in suffering to me is the most powerful ministry that there is. Interestingly, uh, this is an early 17th century source I'm thinking of right now. Um, the the author of it, uh, Bacon was his last name. Um, constructs this dialogue between a man who's suffering and his friends come to console him. And the friend begins with Job and really is angry with Job's friends for not having something to say right away, <laughs> for being silent for seven days. You've got to start preaching the word to this person who's to Job because he needs to know what's going on. And so Protestants sometimes have a, t has a tendency to, to rush to the word 
uh, when, yeah, the word, of course, is the source of the consolation, but we can be mediators of the word even in silence to people who are suffering. Uh, lament to me, uh, protest to me is when you're sort of shaking an angry fist at God and saying, why? And at least some of that protest, is, is, uh, my reading of scripture, ends unresolved. It's resolved in the next psalm, maybe. But there's, but there's a moment where you're allowed just to be with that protest. Uh, protest is an important part of laments. I see lament is the larger rubric, and protest is one version of lament. Uh, but as I say, many laments begin uh, with what sounds like a protest, but then are resolved by the end of the psalm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think related, again, I'm just kind of following the questions here because I think they're all in the same line. So we have a, someone who asks, as a chaplaincy intern in a hospital, how do you translate these big ideas into practically sitting with someone? I think you've pointed to it a little bit there, right? Just to kind of always have the focus on the person who is suffering and to kind of keep it grounded in the actual experience. Uh, and that's something we've all, I think, become familiar with during this pandemic is to recognize that these big ideas actually have practical uh, implications. Yeah, I wrote a piece for uh, a popular uh, publication at the beginning of the pandemic that tried to do this very thing of, okay, how do you take these ideas and translate them into kind of pastoral reality today? And I suggested that Luther's notion of uh, suffering as the alien work of God um, can be extremely helpful, that, again, we don't read the suffering in our lives as somehow evidence for who God is. Suffering, God is somehow in some mysterious way so, uh, sovereign over all of this. Um, but suffering is alien. It's foreign to God's character. It's a foreign tool that he can use. Um, what's proper to God's character is love, is goodness, is grace, <laughs> is life. Suffering is alien to God's character. And just assuring someone, I mean, you don't have to use the phrase alien work of God. You can say, this is not, don't, re, don't, don't take this as evidence of God's attitude towards you. Look to Christ for how God really, what God actually thinks of you. He loves you. He gave his son for you. Um, but I would say, too, that um, we, should be, um, we should be very slow to speak when we're in a chaplaincy situation with someone who's suffering. I, I, I think listening to the person and does the person need some explanation? A lot of times they don't. And when they do, they'll tell us. And then, yes, we know all these different explanations for possible, what, what might be going on in suffering. And simply saying, I don't know, I think is entirely permissible. <laughs> Um, but that God is, is is good. Look to the cross. Well, that's good. Even even someone like Luther would approve of our saying, there is no easy explanation for this. And in, and in many ways, the explanation may be completely paradoxical to what we might think of as God, which is your very point with the alien nature of God, right? Right. Yeah. So I, I, I want to turn, and, and since we're asking other people's questions, I'm going to ask a selfish question because I'm a librarian. I collect rare books from this period. And so I'm just kind of curious... If you can give me a sense and maybe boost my uh, ego a little bit by saying, why is it important to collect these materials? We talked about why it's important to study them, but some of these are available online. Why do we need these old books and why should we turn to these old figures? Well, Brother Bo, I'm sorry, I cannot boost your ego if, if we're talking, you know, in sort of Lutheran, Luther and Lutheran theology. You know, uh, the early, his, early, his early theology was known as a humility theology. Uh, Lutheran. Uh, I'm just having fun with you. Um, I think the collection that you all have uh, uh, in your library is essential for a number of reasons. Uh, one is, I mean, I think we can do a sort of counterfactual here. What would happen if we didn't have the collection that you have or, or the collections like it? What would we lose? Someone could say, well, look, we have critical editions, uh, you know, of at least the major reformers. So at least we have that. Uh, my response would be something like the following. Critical editions are not infallible. They can have errors in them and they need to be checked again and again and again. And the only way to check them is against the original. But, but, but far beyond that, um, we would lose the testimony of thousands of writers whose works will never wind up in a critical edition somewhere. We will lose the voice uh, the experience and the wisdom of the past if we don't retain these collections. I mean, for me, selfish reasons, I like the feel, I like the touch of the book and the paper, and you can learn a lot about my reading marginalia or what work is, is bound with what other kind of work between what kind of covers. And so there's a whole kind of material cultural approach 
that requires that these books um, stay with us. Um, but I think beyond that, it's just the voices that there, are, there will never be enough scholars to create enough critical editions of everything that is important. And so we must have the real artifact. And the other reason we must have the real artifact is because, as I mentioned earlier, I think there's real wisdom for us reading people who lived in a very different culture uh, than, our, uh, than ours, that is in many ways much more honest about suffering. Suffering is not some, is not some affront. It's just part of life. And no, it's not good, um, but it's part of life. And we need to learn how to understand it and cope with it as best we can together. No, I think that's very well put. First of all, my ego is sufficiently uh, buoyed. So thank you for that. Um, and I think we shouldn't overlook the the awe and power of holding a book that a 16th century figure held, right? That there is yeah. a connection that we feel uh, to those people. Uh, and I think your final point is is really an important one. We, I mean, ironically, we call it something like the Protestant work ethic, which is this idea of like, just get moving and, you know, get on with your life. But in reality, these people, as you say, are much more honest about some of the, the, the real bad parts of life that, that we all, that is kind of the thing that holds us all together, right? We are all suffering. So I'm gonna ask a question that came up in, in the chat here as well is how might this relate or differ from longstanding Catholic martyrology literature or, or images of the martyrs, right? So their ideas as, as this questioner asks, as, as I understand it is a certain stoicism amid bodily suffering imitative of Christ's suffering. So how does that connect to the tradition of kind of celebrating those who have suffered? Can you uh, clarify the question just a little bit for me, Bo? There's a lot of moving parts there. Sure. So I'll just read it here. Um, and then if the uh, questioner wants to clarify, how might this relate or differ from what is this? What is this? Theology literature? What is, what is the this in the question referring to? I how think might... this idea, Luther's idea of suffering, perhaps, or the change in the idea of suffering. And so I guess, too, like, how does it connect to this idea if suffering is imitative of Christ? And, and do Protestants still have um, a kind of theology that will allow uh, for uh, martyrdom being something that is, that is admirable in the Christian life? Sure. I think that would be one way to take it. So how does this, this does it change this kind of idea of the celebration or the reflection upon martyr, martyrdom? I mean, there are all kinds of Protestant martyrs, right? Um, and unfortunately, there are Protestants creating their own martyrs <laughs> with other Protestants in the 16th century. Um, uh, the person to read on this is Brad Gregory, uh, of course, Salvation at Stake. Um, um, martyrdom remains fairly stable in terms of its importance um, in the spiritual life and Protestantism, um, and that Christians ought to imitate Christ who was martyred and ought to imitate the martyrs, that, that doesn't fall by the wayside at all. Um, it is, I mean, Luther expected to be martyred, right? I mean, it was, it was a shock to him that he died a natural death. Um, there were a number of occasions when he thought he was going to be um, put to death, executed. Um, so that piece of the Christian martyrological tradition does not drop out. Um, it's this explanation, though, for that the bodily suffering would somehow count as a penance. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's the piece that, that, that would uh, fall by the wayside. Um, that's my best shot at an answer to that question. No, I, I think that gets at it, and I think uh, I appreciate that uh, very much. So I'm quite conscious of our time. I told us we'd get out of here at 1245, so we have two more minutes. So I just want to thank you, Professor Rickers, uh, for your expertise, for being with us today, and for helping us understand um, this important change in, in Europe in the early 16th century and why it might matter to all of us who I think anew are reflecting on suffering um, quite a bit. Um, I want to remind everybody that all of these conversations, this one included uh, in a lightly edited form, uh, are available and will be at pitts.emory.edu slash Kessler Conversations if you want to revisit this or share it uh, with friends. Um, in addition to this, there was some question in the chat about uh, some of the resources that Professor Rickers had mentioned. And I want to give you a minute to mention two of the books that you talked about uh, before, but we will be preparing a resource and study guide for all of these. And so you'll be receiving free email bibliographic references to all the books, but can you remind us of the two books that you might recommend if we wanted to learn a little bit more? Well, the first is by Dennis Swin, N-G-I-E-N, um, and Fruit for the Soul, it's Luther on Lament. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, other scholars would read uh, Luther on Lament uh, differently than I do, um, and so I think it's important to provide counterpoint. Um, 
Um, and then uh, somebody asked about my own uh, work mm -hmm. uh, on uh, this more popular work on trying to apply the alien work of God to the current pandemic. That appeared online in Christianity Today, and I think if you just Google my name in Christianity um, Today, uh, that will come out. And then Todd Billings, uh, really, really beautiful work on lament. Um, I strongly, strongly recommend. Uh, he lives with incurable cancer and has just written a marvelous, marvelous book on how central lament has become in his own experience of contending living with incurable ca cancer. Um, and uh, he's just, he's a remarkable person. So I, I strongly recommend, uh, recommend the work of Todd Billings. Well, thank you for that. As I said, we'll put together a, a resource guide that includes not only these modern authors, but also uh, references to the books that we've mentioned from the particular period, many of which have been digitized, which you can actually experience online. Um, so brush off your Latin and German from the period and you'll uh, be in good shape. Um, but Professor Riggers, thank you again. Thank you all uh, to participating. I'm happy to announce that we have decided to extend the conversations into the spring. Uh, although we're going to turn to a new topic, we're going to look at the issues of wealth and poverty from mm -hmm. the 16th and 21st century in the spring. So uh, you'll be receiving more information about that, but I hope you'll join us. But in the meantime, I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon and I hope you stay safe out there. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much.